Well, before I start, I just want to say that I love this place. I love you all. I've met such wonderful people here. Um, and I was just thrilled to be able to come back a third time. And I'm thinking, oh boy, I hope they have me come back again. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, I'm thrilled to talk about Gansey knitting whenever I can. So <clears throat> I'd like to start off by telling you how I got interested in Gansey's, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the history, the social aspects of this industry of making Gansies and of the construction. So um, I'm speaking about the British Gansey, the Scottish Gansey, the Cornish Gansey, which is different from Stella's Gansies. So, um, so I started off, we're going back to 1984, before some of you were born. And I, I was uh, owner, one of three owners of a yarn shop. And we, and this was in Maryland, and we had no idea what we were doing in terms of business, being business people. But we were having a lot of fun, and we were learning as we went along. And I discovered, well, we figured out that we had to have classes in order to teach the people to want better quality stuff. So I started teaching the classes, and I discovered I loved teaching. So I would write the curriculum. Um, and teach the knitting classes and the advanced spinning. So anyway, so that year, that a lot happened in that year. And one thing was that I read Knitting in the Old Way that year. And that's written by Priscilla Gibson Roberts. This is the newer edition. Um, and she really changed the way I looked at knitting. Um, she gave me the gift of looking at knitting through a historical context, um, looking at knitting that defined people as to uh, their occupation or their geographic location or even their social status. So previous to that, I had uh, devoured Elizabeth Zimmerman's Knitting Without Tears and had started to design a little bit. So um, these two books really laid a good foundation for me for this book. And so one day a friend came over and she said, look what I just found at the library. And I'd never heard of Michael Pearson. And I opened it up. I had no idea what I was going to find. And it changed my life. <laughs> so this is the page I opened it up to. And I was like, oh my gosh, look at all these different ways the shoulder is done in this weird sweater called a Gansey. And look at all the different ways that the necks are done. And it's all traditional knitting. And they were all knitted the same way. You start at the bottom. You knit in the round up to the armholes. You split the work. You knit the front back and forth, the back back and forth. Join the shoulders. Pick up the stitches for the sleeves. Knit the sleeves to the cuff. Pick up for the neck band and knit that. They were all done that way. They were all drop-shouldered pullovers. But each one could be so very different from another. And so literally looking at this page, my workshop just popped into my head, and I saw what I could do. So that was very exciting for me. <laughs> so um, I developed my Gansey workshop. At first, I did the little one that's on the right. That is my one-day class, which I'll be doing tomorrow. And so now I've been teaching that since 1989. Um, but when I was in the middle of writing my book for the first time, the editor said, you know, I think you need to make it a little bigger so the knitter can put it on a 16-inch circular needle. I said, well, OK. So I redesigned it, and now that's my two-day workshop which is actually um, a little better paced. It's not as frantic, but anyway. So um, it took me a long time to work it all out. Uh, I knitted each part over and over and over again. I had so many of these little sweaters coming around, and some, some had the sleeves were too long, or I didn't quite get the shoulder right. Um, but the more I learned about the Gansey, the more I loved it. 
So in those early years, these were the books that I relied on for my information. And um, these books taught me a lot about the people who knitted the Ganseys, um, the British, Cornish, and Scottish cultures, and the knitting techniques, too. So the first written record of a British Gansey was a reference in a newspaper in 1832. So they were knitted all along the eastern coasts of Scotland and England, curled around to the west around uh, Cornwall, which is right there. Whoop, went too far, come back. Okay, there's Cornwall in there. And I always thought, well, what about whales? You know, these little dots don't go around whales. What the heck is going on with that? And so sadly, they really, they had a knitting tradition, but it really wasn't, it had nothing to do with Ganseys. Fishing wasn't a big industry in Wales, which I was very surprised about. So it really truly was around Scotland, down England, around the bottom of Cornwall. So in each of these books, um, the researchers organized the pattern motifs by the towns that, where they found those motifs. So it's, it's very easy to assume then that the pattern motifs um, documented belonged to those particular towns. And so I found out that, of course, that is not the case. Um, that was just the way they felt they needed to uh, present the material. So <clears throat> in addition to the fisher people on the uh, coasts of the UK, also in the 19th century, two, over 2,000 miles of inland canals were built, and the men who worked those canals also wore Gansies. So um, I love Gladys Thompson's book. It's very charming, but it, it seemed kind of awkward to me sometimes to extract the information. Um, not everything was charted, and I find line after line of knitting instruction difficult. I love charts, they're very clear. She did have some charts. Um, but I, I learned a lot from looking at how the information was presented in these different books. And so um, I organized in my book the, mo the motif charts by type. Like for instance, all the trees are on one page and all the anchors are on another page so that you could make your choice. You'd say, well, I really want to have an anchor, so you'd go to the anchor page. And so I thought that made more sense in terms of design rather than by geographic location. So really making the book accessible for knitters was my main goal. So we're very lucky that photography developed in the mid-1800s uh, during the height of Gansey popularity. So Frank Meadow Sutcliffe worked um, around Whitby on the east coast of England, and his beautiful photographs illustrated general living conditions and the working day of the fishermen and of the women and children. Oops. Uh, this is also a photo by Sutcliffe. He had a good eye for posing people so that the photo looked pretty natural. Um, with this evocative portrait, I imagined what it must have been like to wait for days and weeks and months for one's husband to come home who was out following the fish. And financial responsibility for the children often fell to the women during these times, and so they knitted for pay. Uh, the contract knitters in Cornwall would make 17 pence for knitting a fancy gansey and 14 for a plain gansey and 10 if a mistake was found. So that didn't cover the yarn, so a wool broker would come and give them the yarn and they would go home and knit it and then bring it back. So that's not very much money, even back then. I mean, it seems pitiful today, but. So it, it seems incredible that we hear that some Gansey knitters made a Gansey in a week, 
but they used knitting sticks oftentimes, <clears throat> excuse me, and they could achieve great speeds. So these sticks were often whittled by a knitter's betrothed, and they were tucked into the skirt waist and held in place by a linen tape that went around the waist. And the needles were usually 12, 14, 16 inches long. Um, they could be made from bicycle spokes with the tips um, ground on rocks to make them pointy. And so with the stick stuck in your waistband, then you'd put the knitting needle into the hole that was in the, the end of the knitting stick, and it would actually support the weight of the sweater. So it really left your hands free to move more quickly, and you didn't get tired as quickly either. So this knitter is from the Dales, which is not an area where we're really focusing on, but she's using a knitting stick, so I wanted to show it. And um, in the Dales, they mainly knitted gloves and stockings, and, um, and they used curved knitting needles, which I thought was very interesting. So here they are. But typically, the Gansey knitters used straight, long needles. <clears throat> so this is called a goose wing knitting stick, and I just think they're so beautiful, very graceful. And here's a different kind of knitting stick. So the tape would go through this part right here. And there was a poem or something in, written inside. So Wick um, is, is a town situated in the northern part of Scotland. And it was a town of around 1,500 people in population in the 19th century. But during herring season, the town swelled to over 5,000 people. Fishermen came, all the tradesmen who supported that industry, such as coopers who made the big barrels that the herring were packed in, um, the fisher lassies came to help pack the barrels, people to cook food, all kinds of people came. And so Wicks Harbor was increased to hold 600 boats. And these handsome men, they um, all have some great Gansies on, um, except for the one that's got sort of a cardigan jacket on. Um, these were a lifeboat crew in Wick, which was an important job. And so the women came to help with this. They were called gutters, they were called fisher lassies, they were called herring girls. And they were women of all ages, from Ireland and all over Scotland and England, and they started up in the north around the Orkneys and came down south and then around through Cornwall, um, following the herring. And so it would, they would work in groups of three. Two women would gut the fish, and one woman would pack the fish and layer the, layer the layers with salt. And um, so a really experienced gutter could just flick with her thumb and gut the fish and throw it into a basket. So they had several different baskets in order to size. You know, they'd say, well, these are the small and these are the medium and large. So um, this work paid very poorly, and it was done outside in all kinds of weather. And the barrels, can you see them in the background? I mean, they're like this. They're huge. And they could, they could average uh, one barrel an hour. And in one year in Wick, they produced around 88,000 barrels of herring, just in Wick. So there were lots of herring. Here's another. Uh, this is a postcard. Go away. Uh, a photo of the herring girls in Wick. Very dirty work. 
So um, these Fisher Lassies are from Ireland. And this mobile workforce of women traveled from early spring through fall following the fishermen who followed the shoals of herring. Um, when not working, the women were knitting, sharing their favorite motifs, deciphering new ones that they saw in the many ports they went to. And they are the ones who spread these motifs all around the UK. So we can't say a motif originated in this particular town, but we can say this motif was documented in this particular town. So this wonderful photograph actually belongs to Norman Kennedy. He's a Scottish weaver who um, started a weaving school in Vermont. He's in his 80s now. And he, I called him up to get permission to use this photo. And he, he is such a storyteller. It was a delight to talk to him. He said that when he was a young boy, he and his mom cleaned offices to make money, and he found this in a trash can. And so he asked his mom if she thought it would be okay if he took it. And so he kept it, thank goodness. One thing about, about this picture is, he said, oh yes, those are Irish girls. And I said, well, how do you know that? He said, well, I can just tell. Okay, <laughs> I believe him. <laughs> So men wore their best Gansies to be photographed. So you can note the buttons um, on the Gansey at the right. And Michael Pearson, in his book, said that the buttons were only sewn on one particular side. But I have seen historic photographs where they were on the right side, they were on the left side, and even a photograph where they were on both sides of the neck. So really, it was what the knitter wanted to do, how she wanted to make her Gansey. So women who knitted for pay, they knitted while they walked. They knitted doing everything, because time is money. So now I want to talk about the different parts of the British Gansey. So what does make Gansey special? These, maybe you recognize these. These were here a couple years ago. This is from the Moray Firth Gansey Project. And none of them were any older than the 1950s. But it was great to see them anyway. Um, I don't think that they were necessarily indicative of all the different uh, styles of Gansey that were knitted in the 19th century. So here I've sort of pointed out different parts of the Gansey. And some would have all of these parts, and some might not have all of them. But they all had the underarm gusset, which gave freedom of movement to the fishermen so they could pull in the nets and do whatever work they needed to do. Um, certainly, they had freedom of movement because it was a drop-shouldered garment. Uh, because your arm goes straight out here and you have 360 degrees of movement. Whereas like for um, a set-in sleeve, the, the fabric is going to restrict your movement of your arm to some point. So that was definitely a good idea. And actually, I think the British Gansey is um, based on a particular type of underwear, as um, Stella has said. It, I've seen, actually, I've seen woven garments that have the same little gussets here and here. Uh, very interesting. So um, these garments were engineered for comfort. And you'd got, you got that by adding the gussets and straps on the shoulders. Um, they were made for ease of repair. So there was a plain area down here before the patterning started, and also on the lower part of the sleeve. So that was so that when the bottom edges got really worn, you'd just cut that off, pick up the loops, and knit back down to replace that. But also, the type of yarn that was used for these sweaters really made them last a long time. In fact, it was called Siemens Iron, and it was a five-ply yarn with a lot of extra twist, and the yarns were worsted spun. And if any of you are spinners, you know that, what that means. Um, it's different from woolen spun, and it has much more strength than a woolen yarn. Um, 
Also, um, to resist abrasion, they often use doubled yarn in the cast-ons. So let's see. So while the knitters adhered to this very specific style of construction, each garment could be made as a unique expression of the knitter's skill and vision. And that is what engaged me so much. They're all the same, and they're also very different. So I'm going to talk about the different parts now. The, the cast-ons, for instance. We've got the Channel Island cast-on. And that is very durable, as well as being decorative. And it uses three strands of yarn to make a strong edge. The knotted cast-on, boring to make. Cast on two, bind off one. Cast on two, bind off one. So you have two stitches worth of yarn in the space of one stitch. So again, more surface area is going to resist abrasion a lot better. And that didn't show very well. Darn. Anyway, this is supposed to show some of the different types of Seam stitches, they were um, a pattern unto themselves at the beginning and midpoint of the round. They were partly stitch markers, but they also um, made it impossible to really see the jog that happens when you knit in the round. Um, and they used, um, you know, welts that were split, welts that were overlapped ribbing, all different things. The underarm gussets um, were really the hallmark of the Gansey. Um, the one on the far, oh, that's your left, um, is in reverse stockinette. And I would say that's a more modern adaptation. Um, but the seam stitches go around and through the Gansey gusset. And this has cables around the gusset. And so these seam stitches start at the beginning of the Gansey, go all the way up, come around the gusset. Have to have, well, it, she's not there. No. Because the picture above it was square, so they wanted to make the picture below square. So, you know, you give up a lot when you let somebody else publish your book. But then I don't have to do as much marketing, so... You know. Anyway, I I felt bad about that. Crying. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, I'm kind of going through some of the sweaters now. Um, I'll just quickly go through them, and then maybe the people can come up once I call them up, and and I'll talk about each one. But this is the big easy. This was not in the old book. This is in the new book, and the neckline is very unusual because it's a crew, a very generous crew, and then you pick up underneath and make a rolled collar. So it's got a double neckline. And it's done in uh, uh, Quince and Company, really fat yarn that I can't remember the name of right now. Puffin. What? Is it Puffin? No. Osprey. Osprey. Thank you. Yes. Okay. These two were in my other book. Um, so I wanted to show this slide because the brown one, Chelsea's Heart Gansey, has vertical pattern orientation. And Jared's Gansey, the navy one, has horizontal uh, pattern orientation. And here's a child's Snakes and Ladders that was um, in my first book. But they said, um, you can't have any kids' patterns in your new book because that doesn't sell books. So I said, well, I'll show you. I'm going to do a snakes and ladders for big people. <laughs> so there it is. And that's out of Upton Yarns. And it is very heavy. Um, it's a very dense yarn, but it is just beautiful. It's a lovely, lovely yarn. Um, Arisque, um is named. This is an, actually an island off the western coast of Scotland. And it, Arisque comes from the Norse, meaning Eric's Island. And this chart for this sweater was in Ray Compton's book, and I've just always loved it. So I designed the garment. And, and actually, I, I wanted to add in this edition more ways to make it fit you. If you 
weren't just a nice straight person, like I'm not a straight person. So <laughs> um, one thing is that sometimes the Gansies can hike up in the back, and so I've added short rows in the back, in the plain area, to make it a little longer so that it won't do that hike up. And this is Jorn's Gansey. Uh, this is the dark navy blue that was used in the original Gansies, and the color came from indigo. So the aniline dyes had already been introduced in the mid-1800s, but indigo didn't fade in the salt water. So it was used for quite a long time for the Gansey yarns. And this is a very simple classic style. I know it doesn't show up very well there, but um, I wanted to do one that wasn't really fancy. It was just basic. And then there's Musician. This was in the uh, first book. And it's an all over repeated motif, although it's vertical. And again, I used um, a heavy yarn in that. And then this is at sea. This was in Knitting in America. I can't even remember. That was published in the 90s, I think. So the Gansey is timeless and practical even today. And here we've got Nate and Nellie in that beautiful Gansey that um, he got from his mom. And so uh, the Gansey is timeless and fits well. It keeps you warm. It looks great. And I'm really encouraged by all of the interest here to keep this tradition alive. And so beyond the Gansey, there are many more traditions around the world. And so I wish you all a great journey with your knitting. And so you all that have garments on, you want to come on up? Thanks. This sweater um, <clears throat> is in the first book, and I, w I called it something really dumb. I said, this is the white Gansey, because I couldn't think of another name. Well, then everybody was saying, well, could I do it in red? Can I do it in blue? <laughs> and my editor said, you've got to change the name of that. And so I've, it is now called New Haven, because in New Haven, they made Ganseys that were um, or horizontally patterned. Great. Thanks. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so this is Ariske, and it's just a little bit longer in the back. I don't know if you turn sideways if they can tell, but we've got the plain area. Okay, great. And there are shoulder straps here, and there are also strap gussets to round out the neck more. Thank you. I can't. No, can any? They, yeah. Can you turn? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. And maybe. Yeah. Should I turn that off? Maybe. Oh, great. Let's see if I can turn this off. That'll go off in a minute. Okay. So I thought I'd take a walk on the wild side and do a dress, and this is called, um, there we go, there we go, this is called Alouette, and it's, I don't know, it's shaped, it has shaping here, you start out, and you get thinner, and then you do this part, and then it gets bigger again, and I think it's got a uh, three needle bind off for the shoulders, and of course, they all have gussets. Great, thanks. So here is uh, the Big Easy. And yeah, it's got the two neck bands there. And really, you could just do one if you didn't want to do both. But um, I thought that was fun, and it, it has kept me warm. <laughs> so and there's a tree there. OK. So this is Jorn's Gansey. It's just pretty much ribbing, you know, but it's comfortable and it's easy to knit. And 
I enjoyed it so much. <laughs> And so Dottie is wearing one of my um, cardigans, and it's, it's done in Blackwater Abbey yarn. Sadly, that is no longer available. Uh, Marilyn has closed her business, but you can use another worsted weight yarn to do that. And I can't remember the name of it right now. <laughs> anyway, that is not going to be in the book because I wrote so much, I exceeded the pages. So they took it out, and they said, well, we'll put it in the fall issue of Interweave Knits. So, because they said the instructions are 11 pages long. Well, I don't know. It's not that hard. <laughs> okay, great. So here's Snakes and Ladders. And it keeps you busy with your cable needle, but I think it's just... A, Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, I take terrible pictures. So, yeah, in person, it's much better. Thank you so much. Okay, great. And this is Musician. And it's also out of Osprey. And it's got the um, same motif three times repeated across the front and the back. And it's, it's a very simple Gansey. If you would like to try one but you're a little nervous about it, that's a great one to start with. Okay, thank you so much. Are there any questions? No? Okay, any questions? Oh, they want you to parade around down there. Okay, all right, great. Sure. Okay, does anybody have any questions for Beth? Yes. Yes. No, that was, that was me thinking, yeah, I think I want to change that. <laughs> yeah. Frangipani? Yes. New Haven, which is done at uh, six stitches to the inch. That's the one that's got the patterning this way. Um, well, I... So yeah, which, was, one, which one is New Haven? That one right there. Oh, the, the one that, this that one. Uh, Nelly has. Yeah. So, so that's a lighter, not as dense garment because it's knitted at six instead of seven stitches to the inch. Arisque, the maroon one there, that's done in Gansey yarn. Um, actually, the Snakes and Ladders, the gray one, that is a Gansey yarn. It's done by Upton Yarns, and it's a five-ply. Um, and Dottie's um, Cordova sweater is in Frangipani, too. Uh, Jorn sweater, the navy blue ribbed one, that's done in a different Gansey yarn by Wendy, Wendy International. So, um, anyway, there. So, that the Cordova sweater is not on the model's no, I think because she it took it home. Yeah. No, I have it right here in the basket. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so that's definitely frangipani. Okay. Yeah. I can pull that out again for those that. Okay. Thank you, models. Appreciate it. Well, you know what? I left it in the shop. Okay. I wore it. I, you know what? After I modeled it yesterday, it felt so good that I just <laughs> wore it for the rest of until late at yeah. night. So, that's anyway, I want to thank Beth for um, sharing on Gansey. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>